Electric Acid. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Your work can take you all over the place, like Texas. You've never been, but it's going to be great because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. Their free bright side breakfast will give you energy for the day ahead. And after, you can unwind using their free high-speed Wi-Fi. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you shine. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Welcome to Her Extraordinary Life by Design, where we celebrate women who are shaping their lives one extraordinary day at a time. I'm your host, Leslie Gaudette, self-care coach for women who are ready to make self-care a priority to support them in life and business. Every week, I'll be speaking with inspiring women from various walks of life who will share their personal journeys and will discover how they have fearlessly carved their own paths as business owners, passionately pursuing their dreams, and creating a meaningful impact on their communities. So let's get started. Hello, and welcome to our Extraordinary Life by Design podcast. I'm your host, Leslie, and today we're talking with Amy Pons. Amy is a 20-year corporate marketer and people leader who remembered who she was on the soul plane. Making her way into professional coaching in 2022, Amy launched Unlock the Magic, a business and movement toward inviting the divine feminine to launch us into the new way of living, being, working as humans. Beyond her coaching, she also hosts... Women Making Moves, a podcast celebrating and amplifying true intersectional feminism, as well as Heads Marketing for the Workplace Psychological Safety Act, the national movement toward passing a law to hold employers accountable for psychological abuse. Wow. I am excited to talk with Amy today. So let's get started. Welcome, Amy. It is so great having you on my show today. Hey, thanks for having me. And Hearing someone talk about my journey is pretty exquisite because funny, one of my biggest challenges these days, because I live more in the feminine, because I've been so long lived in the masculine, I'm like, I don't want titles. I don't want, I just want to be, well, you can imagine writing a bio is pretty hard for me these days. (laughs) So you did a great job. And I think that covers it, but you know, it celebrates and it, notes for me, I don't ever want to just be one thing ever again. Yeah. I love that. And I think too, because we wear so many hats, we can get lost in the titles. Like so many people, they lead with so many different things and it's really like, who are you? And that's what I want to talk about first. It's tradition for me to have my guests tell us a little bit more about their personal side. So with that being said, tell us more about Amy, the woman getting down to the raw and real you. And then we'll talk more about what you do. Oh, I am in, I am this exquisite fiery Aries that has thousands of women energy, women of past lineage, ancestral in me at any given time that have chosen me, Amy, on this human plane to come forth and do my healing and thus perform the healing on their behalves as well. So what that looks like on a daily basis is that I have this beautiful pendulum of energy between sacred rage and blissful euphoria. (laughs) So runs the gamut. So as a fiery Aries, I am passion. I am, I wouldn't say what's interesting is I think a lot of times passion is construed with like loudness, boisterous, that's not always true. I'm kind of an ambivert where it depends on people, places, and things. If I'm lit the F up, I'm probably going to be real loud and real excited and real, and my whole full Aries shines through. At the same time, I'm extremely clairsentient, claircognizant. So I am constantly feeling energy. Everyone can do that, by the way. You don't need a fancy title like Claire, but I'm saying... We all have sensitivities to different energies. I can feel it in my body. And I now know after, you know, I just turned 42, 
I had always ignored it. I felt pain in my body when there was energy that was maybe not safe or that wasn't for me. And I was like, nah, let me just ignore that and move through it and take, let me take some leave. I'll be fine. So I share all of that because the energetic orbit that I'm in, I'm this fiery Aries that can show up as this beautifully enraged woman fighting for psychological safety. And I know that's getting into more of what I do, but as women, we've been taught, don't be ragey, don't be angry. You know, it's not pleasant. Well, okay. It's not pleasant, but the the activism part of that, I wish to perform my activism, not even perform. I celebrate my activism without exerting power over anyone else. And that's the difference. So like my rage is like, is outward toward raising the vibration of the collective. That's what I'm here to do. That's who I am on the soul plane. So back to your original question, I'm a truth teller. I'm a healer. I'm passionate as all, (laughs) as you can imagine. And I'm amazing. I love that to be able to own that, you know, being open okay to say those things about ourselves. I think it can be really challenging for some people because they feel like, oh, I don't want to sound like I'm all about myself, but we have to be able to lift ourselves up. Sometimes we're the only ones doing it. And I love how you were talking about the emotions, you know, women being told that we're emotional. Oh, especially when something is that time of the month and we get put down for it. And I feel like that is so important for us to just say, like, we can be emotional and that's okay. Emotions are part of our DNA and that's okay. And I like how you talked about that, being able to say that you can be all of those things and still be incredible and amazing and all of the other aspects of who Amy is. So I love that. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. you no, know, yeah. to your point, to your point, I I talk I've been talking about this a lot lately, in that there's a difference between being braggy or arrogant or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I were to come out here and say, I'm amazing and I'm better than everyone, that's the difference. Mm-hmm. I'm amazing. I'm amazing for myself. I'm amazing and I don't have the need to exert power over anyone else. I'm amazing regardless. So That's the difference. And a lot of times where, because to your point, why not say I'm amazing? Why not talk about yourself that way? And again, don't be an asshole about it. Like don't in in a way that exerts power and makes you better than someone. Don't do that. That's where it gets into the ego led, the arrogance led. What I'm talking about when I say I'm amazing, that's from a place of soul that I trust myself. I return and Everything that I do and say, for the most part, is soul led. And by virtue of that, I trust my intentions with everything that I am and have. That is what I'm talking about when I say I'm amazing. Yeah, I love that because for me, that speaks to me in the way that I, when I learned finally to love the person that I am without having judgments or anything extra to say, but just to say that I love the reflection staring back at me, that to me was being able to say, you're amazing, you're beautiful, you have so much to offer and being okay with, you know, maybe certain body parts don't look the same as they did when I was 20 or 30 or 40, because I'm now 61. So my body has gone through so many changes, but my body's amazing because it got me through all of those decades of my life. So I love that you led with that. So I want to shift into what you're doing because you have this extensive career marketing. So what shifted you from corporate marketing to embracing professional coaching and and how has your marketing background influenced your coaching approach? You know, it's when I graduated from college, my degree was in English and publishing. (laughs) So I'm in that bracket of like, you just did the thing and you got the thing and then you did other stuff and the thing. When I came out of school, I wouldn't have told you I was going to be in marketing. I wouldn't have told you I was going to be in coaching. I, at the time, I really loved reading a great piece of literature and that's really as far as I'd gotten. So when I graduated, I was like, well, I, I should get a job. Let's do that. And so I became a bank teller. And soon after the bank was hiring for marketing, I was like, that sounds interesting. 
let me give that a whirl. And then 20 years later, you know, I was through different brands, Babies R Us, Toys R Us, May They Rest, although they're bringing, you know, there's a small resurgence happening in that brand. And then the vitamin shop. And then my last stop was at Discover. In marketing, I think overall, and this has been an interesting turn as I head, headed back into my soul, marketing started to feel icky because it was like making someone want something that they don't need. That's like how it started to feel for me through my healing and growth and that I'll do the rest of my life. Marketing is actually also creating. And I talk so much about the divine feminine and then I'm tapping so much back into her. Divine feminine is flowing, trusting, believing, creating, birthing. And I think that's interesting now that I did that for so many years in the business world. I created a lot of different, whether it be ideas or changing behaviors and things of that nature. I had always been creating. And what started to feel different for me is when my soul started to realize, yes, and what if you were to create on your own? What would that look like? What could that look like? And in the 3D, human Amy, it started to feel really, I started to feel really limited in the business world, like doing the one, you know, being an executive marketer. And because the workplace, by and large, I'm not saying everything, every workplace, by and large, the workplace is still today are operating so firmly in the masculine to where it's become toxic masculine. And there's only a caring about the order, the structure, the money, the hierarchy. So I had a really interesting experience the last year before I pivoted. And it was my, it was a lot of my awakening and my soul team, my spirit team saying, all right, Amy, we're going to lay this out right in front of you and see, see what, see if you take the bait. And they would never do that on the soul plane. I'm just saying that's how I filter it. But there was an experience, kind of a one last straw moment for me. And I I think I'm going to shift the narrative on that. That suggests it was bad. I don't think anything is good or bad or right or wrong. It's that we have different experiences to help guide us like a runway, like a, a lit runway to our higher selves or our best selves. And so the runway was lit up for me. And I said, okay, all right, I could consider what this looks like. And what I started to remember in my time in corporate, I had been the leader of the women's employee resource group. So I started to coach hundreds of women informally. I was like, interesting. And then I'd always been a people leader. And so my favorite part was helping others remember what their unique brilliance is and amplifying that and kind of being that cheerleader. In the professional coaching community, many will tell you we're not cheerleaders. We're not here to make our clients feel better. I would yes and that. (laughs) For me personally, I am that coach that I do believe in you. When we go into relationship together as a coaching, I believe in you. I trust in you. I know you're going to do great things. You've already risen your hand and said, I want more. I want something different. So by virtue of that, I believe in you. So I'm going to cheer you on. That's me as a coach. So. I became that in the corporate world um, through the Women's Employee Resource Group. And then when I had that beautiful runway lit up for me in 2022 and said, what do you want to do? I said, today's my last day. I unsubscribe. And so I knew that I was about to create and burst something into the world. And I didn't know what that was going to be still. I wouldn't have told you about coaching. I wouldn't have told you about Unlock the Magic. What I will tell you is the moment that I said, today's my last day, I sent an energetic wave out to the universe, my soul team that says, I'm ready. Take me, take me on, like, to, or, you know, take me where you want me to go. I'm listening. And ever since then, the three bodies of flow that you shared that I, that I quote unquote work on is my unlock the magic is by and large, my coaching practice. And Primarily, I serve women. I have started to coach men that are interested in tapping into their divine feminine, meaning like that's not, some men are like, you coach men? I'm like, why is that scary? (laughs) Talk to me about that. Because I've been, I am an avid intersectional feminist. So the two go together. Uh, So I would say to you that the pivot, the merging, I went from creating and birthing for more of a business capitalistic environment to creating and birthing in the humanities world within myself, but also those who resonate with me. 
And through that, that has become, and I still do marketing, of course, every day in my own business. And I give a lot of advice to a lot of different entrepreneurs that are saying like, what is this marketing stuff? I don't, what is this? And so I still dabble, I would say, but that element that I see synonymous with the creating and birthing was like my old school marketing job with my new school coaching podcast and psychological safety. So it just moved from like the marketing title into more of the soul awakening, like in terms Mm -hmm. of being and birthing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of which you, you're talking, your podcast, women making moves, how do you aim to amplify the voices of intersectional feminism and what has been one of the most enlightening conversations you've had on the show? So for those who don't know, historically, the word feminism and the term feminist is actually a big trigger for anyone who's not a white woman. And I'd love your thoughts on that if you're comfortable sharing your thoughts on that. So what I learned, especially over the past two years, is that I used to be an amazing white feminist. I used to be, and that's, and I'm not suggesting it's right or wrong. I'm saying that there is an awareness that I came to that, for instance, Everything that I was working on, let's say in my 40 years here, was really focused on what I now know by and large for the benefit of white women only. Whereas for the past year and a half, two years, I've done a lot of research and education and learning personally about what it means to be an intersectional feminist, which is making sure that equity and when something is either legislatively or or not, that there's a discrimination element to it, that there's a lens on it, that it's not, that it's all women. And oh, by the way, that also includes trans women now. So it's like, so it's making sure, and maybe I'll go here too, for those who don't know the term intersectional feminism, it is applying all of the different essences about a woman beyond her anatomy or her gender or things like that. It's all of the intersections that she is. For instance, I am an elder millennial white woman who is a dog mom. I'm a wife. I'm a coach. I'm a, it's all the I ams or what resonates with you. Those are all the intersections in which I meet myself. And so by virtue of that, when I set out on women making moves, I didn't want to just talk to all the women that look like me that have done the things that I've done. And so I very intentionally go out and my whole goal was to celebrate and amplify not only the different kinds of women there are all over the world, but also what is your lived experience, learning what that looks like so that I can apply more knowledge to my arsenal and go on the front lines in my activism, et cetera. And what's interesting is in the Workplace Psychological Safety Act that I work on with a national team is that the core of it is discrimination. Not suggesting not all types of people get abused in the workplace. They do. They're, but the numbers skew really largely into the discrimination piece toward women and people of color. So it's just understanding more beyond, especially in the podcast, what are the unique things that women are doing, especially after the great resignation, after the pandemic, and seeing once again that the workplace still isn't designed with all of us in mind. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you, you, when you brought up the workplace discrimination, I want to get into that. Like your, what you've got, you, you talk about the workplace psychological safety act. But one of the things that I can say just as a personal experience for me, you know, I am a woman of color. However, I'm a woman of color who doesn't wear her hair natural in the natural state. And I was working in a job Oh, back in the early 2000s, just, I guess, more more to the later of the 2000s before the housing crash. And the office that I was working at, the law firm I was working at, had another Black woman, another uh, woman of color, who wore her hair naturally. She was hired that way. And when I came upon the scene with my hair done, I mean, I've always, since I was young, since I was 15, I'd been straightening my hair. And when I came on the scene, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden she got called into the office and was asked about changing her hair. 
and she was there before me. So it, again, that whole, that this discrimination piece, you know, it floored me to even know that you hire someone, obviously she's intelligent, she knows what she's doing, but then all of a sudden someone else comes in, you're seeing is that your ideal look. And now you're trying to say that if you don't look this way, you're not good enough. Yet I was good enough the way you hired me in the beginning and I'm doing good work. So it was really interesting. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about the Workplace Psychological Safety Act, because I want to know your thoughts on how it could reshape employer responsibilities alongside employee well-being. First, I would ask, did I answer your question about intersectional feminism in the podcast? Absolutely. So like just to go back to that really quickly, for me, I never really thought of myself as a feminist because I never really talked to anyone about feminism. Nobody in my life was talking about it. You know, I knew women that they talked about that were feminists. But for me, I think what I understood feminism to be was, you know, bra burning and all of these other things Mm -hmm. that people told me was the meaning So I liked what you were saying about the intersectional feminism, where it's like the intersections of self. And Mm -hmm. so it's more of a positive way of looking at it. It's not looking because there's there's that negative. There's that negative stigma, I think, that is attached to the word feminism and, you know, oh, you're a feminist. And so people look down on that when it's really just about the rights of women in a positive way. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's you know, celebrating. We just, yeah. It's celebrating women. It's, so it's celebrating I love them. Yeah, it's celebrating women. You're right. It's historically, it's been, and how many sexual revolutions have we had? And we still continue to have them. Bra burning, men hating, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. For me, that's a hard no, meaning men hating. So for me specifically, and I just had this conversation with a, a man recently, he assumes that when I said I'm a feminist, he was like, oh, you only want women to succeed. And I said, that's false. I want all humans to succeed on an equal playing field. And until we get there, I will continue to talk about intersectional feminism because again, it's a fact too that white women still have privilege, more privilege than other women. I will not rest until that is equal. And that's what I'm talking about. You're actually, you're absolutely right when you say like it's intersection of self. And you asked another question that I forgot to answer, which was the most interesting conversation. I've interviewed close to a hundred women at this point in the past year. Dr. Nikki Lanier, she is an incredible human that has, is doing things really interestingly. She has in her business, she set up a collective for, women of color to succeed in the workplace. And then she's also set up a cohort only for white women. And she's expressed to me that conversation was really, really fascinating because she expressed to me that a lot of black women there, and again, not right or wrong, don't want to educate white women about what they should know about women of color in the workplace or in the world in general. Mm -hmm. She and her organization do want to do that. And they're taking that on and they do kind of like this roadshow across the United States and build these cohorts of white women that not only, and it's for the white women, by the way, that really want to drive change and understand it and understand that even they still have biases that are unconscious or conscious. That conversation was truly fascinating to me because she was just sharing how she's approaching that work. And then it looks very different depending on the cohorts that she works with. I find it so interesting because I think two things, even white women that I talk to on a daily basis, they're like, Amy, what on earth are you talking about intersectional? And so there's this unknowing about what that even means, feminism as a whole. And you're inspiring me based on your questions of like how I should talk about feminism and kind of educate on my views on what feminism means to me and intersectional, all of that, because it can mean differently it can mean something so di- so much differently to everyone. So, but Dr. Nikki was a really fascinating conversation. She was in season one and she's on the forefront to help people understand what it is, what it isn't for black women, women of color in the workplace. And then further, how especially white women can be allies, not just kind of lip service, like let's really get in there and understand it and dismantle it. So, yeah, yeah. 
And I think like anything, any change that has to happen, there has to be people who are willing to come to sit across the table from each other to have those conversations. So yeah, I think that's really why I told you the story about the woman that I, I worked with having a completely opposite reaction to how she looked after I came into the picture, which I thought was really unfair. And so that's why I asked you that question around the Workplace Psychological Safety Act. I also think like, again, that intersectional feminism too, this person that was questioning her was another woman. She was a white woman. And so again, it's just not having enough, I think, education around things. I feel like it's there seems to be a lot of resistance for whatever reason for these conversations to be had. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm open and I think it's because my mom is white, my dad is black. So I come from a multicultural family, although I did grow up not really knowing my father's side of the family. So I really only had one side of my family influence. However, I was always open to learning about my other side of my identity, my other side of like who I am. And I really felt that as I've gotten older, that there's just still so much pushback on trying to change the narrative. Instead, what I've seen looking going on it from what I'm seeing looking from the outside in is that there's still this narrative to want to keep it on the same issues over and over again to like continuously bring these same issues up to use them to educate people but there's nothing beyond it like in other words there's the problem but we'd rather focus only on the problem and no one's talking about the solution and so i think that's what i believe what this workplace psychological safety act is going to be able to do that this legislation is going to help reshape just in like the business, like in corporate, the employer's responsibilities, as well as like how that can affect the employee, whether they are of color or whether they're not, but they're learning together. So coming back to that question, what are your thoughts around like, how do you think, is this going to reshape things in the way that you hope? Like, what are your thoughts behind that? So unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are illegal in the U.S. and that have laws around them, and they still happen. And so Workplace Psychological Safety Act, and it's gaining so much momentum right now, especially in light of Dr. Kennedy Bailey and the fact that the president was reinstated with after no abuse being found, which is hogwash. So I want to start with what is psychological safety in the workplace. and. For any individual, allowing dignity and authentic sense of self to not be judged by anyone else. So I share that because as head of marketing for WPSA, we're about to go live with a campaign in May about what is psychological abuse because unfortunately, the state of the workplace today, there's a lot of narratives such as you got to pay your dues. It is what it is. Oh, they act like that to everybody. Et cetera, et cetera, on and on. So, a lot of the abuse that's happening, a lot of folks aren't even aware that it's not healthy. And then they go on to perpetuate that. So, it's this harm cycle, harm cycle. So, I'd answer your question with we need a law. And that's what the Workplace Psychological Safety Act will provide is that there will be a state and someday federal, an entity that will hold an employer accountable the same way that EPA or OSHA would for the workplace when there would be an incident that arise. That's kind of one part of my answer, which is like, awesome, let's, let's, we need a law. Because today when someone's abused psychologically in the workplace, I get these uh, stories every single day. Lawyers won't even take the case on because there's no way to prove it. And oh, by the way, further, there's no law, there's no precedent to say it is illegal to psychologically abuse someone in the workplace. So we need a law. The second part of that, I would say to you is that it's so much more beyond pointing a finger, accusing someone, blaming someone. We certainly want justice, especially for someone who is being psychologically abused. And for me personally, and this is where my intersection meets, my whole purpose here, which is to help humanity heal, evolve, and vibrate higher, 
those abusers, they learned that somewhere, somehow. And if we think about workplaces today that were created 30, 40, 50, 60, even 100 or more years ago, take a step back in time to see when that business was created. And there was only one type of person at the helm, well, still today, frankly. But my point is, there's one type of person creating good services and systems for one type of person to benefit one type of person. That hasn't aged or evolved. And so what happens is the same things that get someone promoted, even women or people of color, anybody, the same things in a toxic work culture that gets someone promoted, they set out being like, I'm going to be that change. I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z that my boss is doing. I'll never do that. Then you get the title and the raise and you quickly realize you're required to continue operating in what is harmful to keep your own stability and security and safety in your job. And then that becomes a larger soul conversation. Do you want to keep doing that? Do you not want to keep doing that? And then you adjust accordingly. But what we're seeing right now is the big four generations are in the workplace. So we have Boomer, X, Millennial, and Z. Okay. So think about how every one of those generations, who raised them and where they were coming from. Don't get me wrong. This is not justifying anyone's behavior or anyone's harmful acts. And it's also until we get to the root of who's doing the abusing and why and where to really uproot not just the people, but the deep-rooted systems in place that created these workplaces, unfortunately, with or without a law, psychological abuse and other types of abuse, discrimination, gender gap, everything. Those will keep happening as long as we don't uproot the systems, but also get the abusers some help. Like, what do you need to feel safe in this in this space? You don't feel safe. What's up? So I would answer your question. It's a long, long answer, but that's like the both and. We need the law. Mm-hmm. And then we also need something in place. Like, and, and let me give you an example. When this law is federal, what I would want to see is the employer hand mandated, whether, whether it be therapy or coaching, to the abuser. And then also same to the abused, but also, but, but in a way where, and I don't even know, coaching might not be the thing for the abuser because many of those folks, if you're familiar with the business world, they all have coaches. And me personally, as a coach, I would coach that person out of that behavior, but it depends on, again, what kind of relationship they have with their coach. So I would say mandated therapy to the abuser to see where that comes from and start helping them understand. Now, with that said, and this is why it's super multi-layered. <laughs> well, and I'll, maybe I'll leave it there. Those, they, it's it's extremely multi-layered, but that's how I would suggest it's like the both and we need a law and we need the abusers to get help and for the abused to be able to feel like they have a safe space to come back or to keep identifying as their authentic selves. What's fun about Gen Z is they don't give a crap. They're coming in. Mm-hmm hot off the presses, like you're going to bend to my will and no matter what, that's where they're coming from. So as you can imagine, and we need that, by the way, we need that kind of harsh disruption to the workplace so that we can swing the pendulum back to the middle. But as you can imagine, some of the older generations don't care for that kind of mentality. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love how your answer. I love the fact though, too, that you brought it back to the person who is the abuser, the person who is causing disruption in that way in a workplace, needing to have that support too, because like, you're right, they did learn, these are learned behaviors. So what they learn, they can unlearn, but they still need that support. And I think it's not about saying, oh, you're bad and kick you out no, because they're not going to, they're not going to learn from that. They're no. not. And they'll yeah. just go somewhere else. <laughs> right. And then if you fire, I'm not suggesting everyone, we would further the harm if you just like fire everybody that yeah. unfortunately that's where, and I'll speak from personal experience, like this is where it's at. You reach a certain point and it's like you 
kind of, it's like a switch is flipped and, you know, you realize quickly that you're one voice and that one voice is going up against not just a hundred people, bodies, humans, but also maybe a hundred years of deep rooted conditioning rooted in patriarchy, white supremacy and capitalism. So it's like, oh, oh, okay. I can't do this alone. So it's so multi-layered, and I do care about supporting both of them. Because if we also keep firing everybody that's abusing everybody, we're going to have a real big surprise because no one's going to be left. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know I could continue talking with you forever. The, just what we've covered today has been so incredible. I know I'm definitely going to have you back on the show, but thank you so much for joining me and sharing, of course, your journey, the various impactful initiatives that you're a part of. I really love the fact of us talking about feminism because it was not really something that was talked about in my home. You know, I learned just what the external people were saying, whether it's the news, whether it was written news, or whether it was news on television. That's what I came to understand was feminism by what they were saying. It was always something negative. Oh, that woman or those women. And it was, there really was nothing positive about it. So I'm really, really happy that we got to talk about that. And then of course, everything around having those equal opportunities in a business, a workplace for someone without being, as you were saying, psychologically abused and being able to have learning moments, I think teaching moments and the employer, again, change does start from the top down. And I don't care what anyone says, you trying to get someone help for your one department in your company, that's great. But if you're not adopting what they're learning, doesn't make, it doesn't matter because that will never fly. Like you need to have, the change has to start from the top down. So if you're going to implement something within your organization, it has to be something that you truly believe in. So I love that. I'm going to make sure to include all your contact information in the show notes for anyone interested to explore more about your coaching and unlock the magic. And we'll definitely have you back to talk more about that as well, or even your podcast, Women Making Moves and your advocacy efforts. Yeah, I'm just so ex- excited that you were on today. I truly appreciate you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'm very excited to be in orbit with you. And it's been almost a year now since we met, I believe. It's been yeah. almost a year. So it's just, I'm I'm grateful to continue meeting amazing women like you that are blazing the trail of what life can look like that we weren't necessarily taught and that the world still isn't necessarily set up for, but we're blazing it. So thanks for being out here with me. Oh, thank you so much. And to our listeners, I hope today's conversation with Amy offers you fresh perspectives on leadership, empowerment, and creating a nurturing environment wherever you are. You can actually make the change. It just takes one to start the train, whatever they call that. That I forget what they call that train, you know, when they're dancing. <laughs> Anyways, remember your approach to life and work can be a beacon of change and positivity. Until next time, keep dreaming, keep believing, and keep designing your extraordinary life one day at a time. Thank you for joining me on Her Extraordinary Life by Design. I hope you've been inspired and empowered by the incredible stories shared on this show. If you enjoyed this episode and the conversations we've had, I would greatly appreciate if you could take a moment to leave a review. Your feedback and support mean the world to me, and it will help others discover the podcast and join our empowering community. Remember to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Together, we can continue to learn from these amazing women uncover their extraordinary journeys, and be motivated to create our own lives by design. Thank you again for tuning in. Until next time, stay empowered and keep shaping your extraordinary life one day at a time. Ever thought about starting your own podcast? Do you have a business or a message you want to share with the world? Well, now it's easier than ever with Electricast. Hi, I'm Mark Netter. And I'm Peter Rafelson. We're the founders of Electricast Media. Whether you want to start a new podcast or already have one, join Electricast to grow your audience, monetize your content, and build your community. With our simple sign-up, you get free promotion, world-class analytics, premium ads, and personal support. Go to electricast.com and join our community today. 
Electric Acid. Transform your influence. Electric Acid. Everyone has heard about the U.S. space program, but what is actually going on at NASA? Get the real story in four minutes or less with the NASA Daily Podcast from Electric Acid. Join astronauts and researchers as they conduct groundbreaking experiments, work on the International Space Station, and reach for the stars. NASA Daily, your cosmic update. Electric Acid. Electric Acid.